All right, me this everyone. Welcome to First Foods. We are going to get going. My name is Desiree King. Mm -hmm. I'm a Miwok Two Spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory in Colorado. Hello again, it's me, Brooke. Uh, I'm a Taino mother living in Matinecock territory and just welcoming everybody back to First Foods where we um, host weekly classes and then at the end of the month, a panel along with a giveaway. Our interpreter is Mayra Mateo. She is a Nahuatl woman, uh, indigenous to Mexico, and she will be translating for us. So if you see the globe at the bottom, you'll be able to switch the globe to the translation services that you need in Spanish. Um, so thank you. We do have some brief disclaimers to make as well. First Boots is for educational purposes only. So anything you learn here uh, before using or ingesting any herb or plant for medicinal or culinary purposes, please consult a physician, medical herbalist or suitable professional. Don't just go putting things in your mouth, that's actually dangerous. Even if you think you know what it is, you still should be concerned. Mm -hmm. so, so just briefly, um, land acknowledgement, native knowledge, intertribal space and foraging, harvesting, food sovereignty, and of course our disclaimers, which we just mentioned. We have these protocols both uh, for non-native and native um, participants in our group. So the first one is land acknowledgements and Land acknowledgement essentially is a statement. So, you know, we recognize that the First Nations and every nation has their own territory are the ruling and governing bodies of Turtle Island. And we uphold that. And we expect people who are joining into this space to follow, uh, follow protocols and formalities and really respect that, that the, um, like go and do the investigative work. If you don't know the nations that are from your territory, make sure that you're finding And then of course, moving forward, all native knowledge that is shared in this group is not to be monetized or repackaged or misappropriated or appropriated period. These programs are made for other indigenous people to learn that don't have access to the cultural knowledge or just for natives just to share amongst each other. And that should not be abused or misrepresented or monetized on as we spoke before. And then of course, it's an intra-tribal space. Remember that we all come from different nations. Um, there are some plants, foods, and medicines that may be different protocols for one area versus the other. Always just consult your medicine people, but don't allow that uh, to kind of cause rifts and not build relations in this group. In this group, we really want you to just focus on, you know, your knowledge base and be humble and and, and not trying to prove who's more Indian or the next person or anything like that. So just build on your relations in this group. It's time, you know, that we start building on relations and working towards each other and, and not belittling or trying to, you know, do, have a one-upmanship. That's not what the space is about. So just please respect that. This is an intertribal space. And then foraging and harvesting. Uh, of course, we've spoken about this in various ways. If you are non-native, you should be seeking permissions from the local communities uh, uh, through land acknowledgement, which nations were traditionally there if they got pushed off or if they're still there, what plants you may or may not take from and always respect if the answer is no. Food sovereignty. So indigenous people, we have the right to partake in our food systems in either modern or you know ancestral ways. And it's just not up for debate for non-Indians to be involved in those conversations. Those are internal, uh, internal community responsibilities. So if you see any uh, discussion, either through the panels, the, the classes, or even online amongst community members, and you are a non-native, that's your, your cue to step back. And then lastly, our disclaimer, which uh, Desiree read earlier is, first foods is for educational purposes only. Before using, ingesting any herb or plant or medicinal or culinary, uh, for culinary purposes, 
please consult physician, medical herbalist, or suitable professional. And for those who are traditionalists, always consult your community, grandmothers, aunties, and so forth. And medicine keepers too. Mm -hmm. um, before we go into today's class, we just wanted to really take a moment to acknowledge what's happening right now in the USA part of Turtle Island and just be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and what's going on. So we just wanted to have a short, uh, just memorial for George Floyd and just a moment of silence for the men that were taken away from us too soon in our communities by the officer, uh, Shavin. Uh, thank you for that um, brief moment of silence. We just want to give you know, our love and support to those families, to those community members who lost their relative. And for those who are finding themselves in a similar situation, uh, we just want to give you that medicine, that respect, that honor. And we see you, we see you, and we love you. Okay, everyone. So welcome to First Foods, a program led by and made for Indigenous people and our allies who are ready for a new day for old ways. We'd like to thank our partner, Ibex Puppetry, and my phone, <laughs> Ibex Puppetry for the ongoing support as we build this program that makes critical culture available from the knowledge bearers who hold the oldest knowledge on the continent which is something so many of us need at this time. So today we have Shannon Francis as our instructor from Kikot Movi, Arizona. I hope we pronounced that accurately. Now Shannon is a certified permaculture design instructor, focusing more on indigenous permaculture, the weaving of traditional econ ecological knowledge and focusing more on indigenous um, with innovative science. She's the mother of six children and she comes from 12 generations of earth caretakers and seed keepers. That's right, 12 generations. <laughs> She's an active educator and has presented and taught widely on permaculture design and practicing indigenous permaculture at the Denver Indian Family Resource and uh, the Rocky Ridge Boarding School on the Navajo Nation. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today, uh, Shannon is teaching on soil tasting and soil health. I don't know how many folks have actually heard about soil tasting, but it is completely fascinating. And she is going to teach us. So thank you and welcome, Shannon. Hey, thank you. Um, ke ani ashla ado tachi ni bashishina do shimasana ke ani ado shche kesani. Um, hello, my name is Shannon Francis. I am the executive director for Spirit of the Sun. I am a former, the former board chair for Four Winds American Indian Council, and I'm still leading the um, Four Winds Indigenous um, Garden Project um, in Denver at Fifth and Bannock. So if you haven't been here. Um, at Four Winds, please come by, check us out. We've been building this garden since um, 2014 and um, have come a long way in like the last five years to building our soil. And we have um, a perfect um, model of um, healthy soil um, in, in different areas of both of our gardens. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you Desiree and Brooke for inviting me to be part of First Foods. And I'm happy to share the knowledge um, I don't have a degree. I am certified in permaculture, but I've been practicing, my people have been practicing permaculture <laughs> way before it became a contemporary uh, word. But um, I would say 
permaculture, you know, the contemporary permaculture is um, by far uh, teaching about the scientific techniques of agriculture and irrigation um, and all the other things that come with that for natural building. But these are all techniques of, you know, ancient wisdom and knowledge from indigenous peoples from around the world. And so uh, permaculture does teach that innovative science, but it lacks the, um, the language, the stories, the songs, and the teachings um, that, that go with um, each bioregion that, the, um, that those landscapes are from and the people that are from, from there. So it is missing a lot of the information, so it's not really complete. Um, it is a savvy, sexy, you know, thing that people love to learn more about, but without those teachings and without the history and the wisdom of the peoples that it comes from, it's not really complete. And I, I don't believe that um, non-Native people who are teaching permaculture really know what they're teaching about, um, because that wisdom is really tied into our genetic memory and it's part of the, the landscapes in the region. Um, wherever these, wherever indigenous peoples come from. So uh, I, it, it is an introduction to other things, but um, I, I don't really want to talk about permaculture today. We do have a permaculture framework that when I was working at Woodbine that I um, am sharing, and it just teaches more so on um, the, more of the indigenous principles and alignment with permaculture and what those are. Um, a lot of that is, uh, you know, lessons from our creator. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, the relationship of, um, of our plants and our scenes and the relationship, uh, this ancient relationship between bacteria and humans, which is our soil. And the wealth and the health of our soil uh, determines the outcome of everything on Mother Earth. And when you understand those connections more um, intimately, um, connecting to the natural world and really utilizing all of your observation and your senses um, can really uh, help you understand um, plant behavior, the elements, um, what's in the soil. It's a whole communication system. It's a whole nervous system that really, if we're, we, you know, we, with all the disturbed soil, um, the outcomes are happening now, you know, outcomes to our health, to our livestock, to our trees, um, even with water, because um, our soil filtrates water, and um, it's, it's the central nervous system of everything that we um, rely on and that sustains us. So it's very important um, to really start educating our youth and our community and tying in the inter intergenerational knowledge pieces from elders to the next generation on um, the, different, um, the different teachings and the traditional ecological knowledge um, that comes from lessons from our creator when we were given this land um, to maintain and to take care of. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Four Winds and the garden here that we've been working on. I have um, built, helped build three gardens. One was at Woodbine Ecology Center in Sedalia, and I was there for about five years for the Indigenous um, Agricultural Project. And um, we grew a uh, um, a garden on uh, an old basketball court, which was all concrete. And folks said it couldn't be done, but we looked at different angles on how we could start something because of the garden that we had were like way far, it was much farther um, out of the way um, and more into the wild. And um, that didn't work. We did that for two years and it just didn't work. So we brought the garden closer to where it was closer to humans and in the way of traffic that it was more attended to. So based on these experiments, um, add Woodbine to learn more about soil. And the soil is different from where I'm from, from Hopi. And um, uh, knowing that it was a shorter growing season, the altitude, the elevation, all of these things contributed to um, healthy soil building. And then went and timing, timing is everything as well. But once you start learning about the soil in your area, whether it's your house or your um, backyard or in your you know, containers or in your garden beds, um, that you start learning about um, the different um, textures, the different um, colors 
and what's living in your soil. And if your soil does not, if you, if you dig in your soil and you don't see anything and it has no life, it means that it cannot sustain anything. It won't sustain plants either. So if you dig into soil and you have worms and you have different types of bugs, I mean, that's one thing that you will know that that soil will sustain life. And, um, and that kind of goes more so with um, disturbed soil all around the planet, that there are dead zones. Um, you know, mankind and, and humans have not contributed in a good way um, to really amending soil and building healthy soil. Uh, the more soil erosion that's happening is occurring from uh, surface mining, from natural resource extraction, um, even like hydrocarbon, you know, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that are contributing factors to disturbed soil. And what can we do to really start amending soil to start really healing ourselves? And um, it's, it's, always, it's, uh, it's been proven scientifically that uh, microbes in our soil um, act as antidepressants and really can, can heal us in more um, than one, you know, more than other ways. Um, but as, um, as we started this garden at Woodbine, we realized that um, there was much more to soil amending, especially in an area that was just nothing but forest and acidic soil. And then learning about all the different soil types, um, I've been doing that and, and learning about each region. So when we moved from uh, the, when I moved from the garden project at Woodbine to the Denver Indian Center, which is more in um, uh, West Central Denver, that the soil was a lot different than, of course, you know, the Sedalia area. And um, and then when I we we did that project for five years at the Denver Indian Center, and then moved the project to Four Winds American Indian Council, which is probably less than three miles from the Denver Indian Center. But again, the region for the soil was um, mostly clay, a lot of wood, a lot of hardwood ash. Um, it was in high need of amending and we had to start from scratch. But um, knowing that we had done this project like at least twice before, that it would take about five years to have some type of healthy, good soil. Um, and a lot of it was um, also becoming and putting more nutrients into the soil that it had lacked. And our soil is mainly consistent of magnesium, phosphorus, calcium, um, boron, and um, a few other things. And when it's lacking that, that means you have to find those nutrients in other places unless you wanna um, spend money on um, commercial type fertilizers, which I don't believe in because um, they also can contain other things that are not good um, for, you know, for edibles. And so uh, building your own soil is something that is very needed and should be in every household um, to transition to zero waste. And um, most of our, um, resources um, like deadfall, tree cuttings, I mean all these things that are actually in, exported out to the landfill should stay within the cities to start being, you know, uh, recycling that nutrients back into the soil. So that's something that I, I have been encouraging, we have been encouraging here at Four Winds American Indian Council to transition our facility to zero waste and everything that would come out of um, our garden um, food bank would go back into um, our garden as fertilizer through hot composting. And so we have a couple of composting systems that we've um, been trying and then we're investing in a third one that will actually uh, produce a higher efficiency um, through uh, battery operated or solar operated batteries to, um, to uh, produce uh, more compost, you know, to heat it up more and ventilate it and aerate it more. So, um, as much as as much as the compost that we're utilizing that um, we have to come up with a better you know system and a better way of doing that and, and a safer system too because there are good bacteria and there are not so good bacteria. Um, the bacteria that actually acts as an antidepressant in soil is is something that I really wanted to talk about because um, <clears throat> layers and layers um, throughout history of PTSD have been you know, among our indigenous peoples for hundreds of years. And, um, and our ancestors knew that our relationship with the earth, with the soil, um, with the natural elements and the natural world, that this, um, this, the mother earth really 
um, produces um, things for healing and then that our, our ancestors have known like for each region, the landscapes and um, the areas in which, you know, we've existed, like my Hopi people and Diné people, um, they have um, techniques that um, the old ones had talked to me about not too long ago about soil tasting. And when I heard about it, I was like, this was someone at Hovilla saying, this is, this is what our people used to do, but we don't do that anymore. And I kind of thought like, wow, you know, who's passing on that knowledge? Who is, um, who's practicing it? And I haven't really heard about anybody practicing it. And um, I was talking to my mom about it. And um, she said, I never really heard about that, you know? So um, the more that I had engaged in conversation with other elders and other farmers, nobody had really started, you know, um, tasting the soil or knowing that that was something that we're so intimately close with in farming and the connections to our plants. Um, those relationships, those symbiotic relationships that this, why wouldn't this be a part of it? So reintroducing soil testing or soil tasting is something I think that would be very beneficial in teaching our youth and teaching our young folks, um, you know, the difference. And um, I've been out and I've been doing this myself on my own. I haven't been like teaching anyone um, because I think that it is something that I have to learn and have to really get good at before I can start teaching it. But um, I'm always out in the garden, like um, tasting the soil in different areas. And um, I'm telling you that it is like, it's, it's, you can taste disturbed soil from um, really healthy soil. And I was just out there earlier and um, tried different areas around Four Winds and the compost that we've actually produced tasted just really, it tasted great. It was like fluffy soil, it, it was satisfying. I mean, I don't even know how to describe it, but one area I could taste some, some type of a metal um, and it was dry, it was really powdery. Um, so the different tastes and the different textures um, really stood out. And um, as I'm getting to know more of the, of the, the taste differences, like what, what certain areas are lacking. And, um, and I think that would be a really beneficial way for people to start learning how, you know, um, what is needed in their, in their soil. And, and like every 10 feet, is different. It's not all the same. Like every 10 feet is, it, it tastes different. But um, this technique is, is something that is old. And I think if there's other elders and other folks out there that could, um, could really reintroduce this technique, I think would be really beneficial, especially just going back to basics. People, I mean, native peoples and my ancestors have been doing this for so long um, with really reconnecting to um, the natural world and really trying to emphasize and encourage um, helping other young folks to connect to the natural world as well. Um, our ancestors knew that uh, our soil um, was, it was, you know, when, as we're younger, that we're encouraged to play outside, we're encouraged to, to really do more things outside. Um, it is our first um, outdoor classroom. It was my first outdoor classroom and making mud pies and going into the ant piles and getting stung. I mean, I did it all. Um, but really, that was my classroom. And when I, I um, am feeling down or I'm feeling, you know, I go back to those childhood memories of like, wow, what does this, this the soil smells like? The, the different smells, like I can remember really good memories of the, of the rain first coming at Hopi and smelling that first smell when the rain touches the soil. And, um, and that's healing. I mean, a lot of what we do is healing, but our soil is just, it's that basis and emphasis of our nervous system and, um, and our, our connection to um, soil in terms of uh, this antidepressant is everything that kind of comes from our gut, our di digestive system. So, um, our digestive system is connected to our immune system. Um, our, our moods and our sense um, come out of this. That is encouraged, influenced by our digest digestive tract. And um, and I and I the only way that I can say that um, the microbes in the soil 
um, it's kind of like the movie Avatar. I really didn't like that movie, but the only way I can explain it is connecting to the soil through our nervous system. And, um, and I've done this a lot with my own kids. And we had a summer youth camp at the Indian Center in 2015 and 2016. And um, we had 40 youth that started with the summer camp. A lot of these youth came from different backgrounds, um, domestic violence. Um, most of them couldn't even have a large at attention span longer than five to 10 minutes. And we had them in the garden, working in the garden three days a week. And we had a set schedule of watering, talking to the plants and visiting the plants and drawing the plants and having these journals um, with these kids. And into the third and fourth week, we noticed that um, the attention span doubled. We also noticed that there was less fighting, um, that kids were more focused on um, having a relationship with the plants that they were growing and watering, that they, um, they uh, were aware of other things in the soil that was growing, bugs in the soil, pollinators, they learned about all different pollinators. But I think just getting them into the soil and doing weeding um, was really a part of their um, larger therapy and long-term or short-term. And we had, um, we had a couple of, um, we had different types of um, youth that were having specific, you know, um, things happening and challenges in their life going on. We had one kid, um, one youth who was autistic and um, he, you know, was, he was always kind of by himself, but when he got into the garden, it was just, he wanted to take pictures. I mean, just a whole different environment just was a safety. It was a security and a safety space, a safe space for kids to be able to be and to be able to put their hands in the soil and to be a lot calmer and to have more a longer attention span. So we saw this project as a pilot project to do um, additional summer youth camps. And then the second one was actually held at Four Winds in the garden where we, um, the kids, uh, the young native women, actually the group had designed the Four Directions um, med medicine garden, medicine wheel in the back of the, the building. And so it, it was incorporated with philo different philosophies and different principles of um, how to be a good human, how to be a good relative and how, and what do we need to do in, in, in order to really take care of mother earth, all these, all these principles that were in alignment with mindfulness. And so out of that came our medicine wheel garden um, and it, it's been going great. Um, I think the soil has so much um, knowledge and wealth that can teach us and I think going back to the basics again in, in um, terms of um, our senses and really um, just utilizing those senses um, as our ancestors have done. And I think the technology that is being utilized can be used to an advantage. But again, it's like, you know, people have to go out and start really wanting to um, participate in doing things as far as gardening um, and showing their families how to really grow food and how to amend soil. Um, soil amending, unfortunately, doesn't take place on its own anymore. As, as, as quick as we are really um, depleting our soils and the soil erosion is happening, we have to um, look in terms of how much we can give back and put back into the soil to really um, start nourishing um, those areas that are really disturbed. Um, but again, um, the, the different soil types are, you know, in different places, it kind of varies. So um, I, would, uh, I would encourage people to really start looking at um, doing different methods of uh, soil building. Um, again, permaculture offers some things in the way, but traditional knowledge and wisdom that um, different nations have and different tribes have that um, that there's a lot of knowledge and um, wisdom in those teachings. And if you're fortunate to have an elder that has farmed and, and grown food before, that there is a lot of um, wisdom in that and to get a hold of those elders and to really start asking questions on what soil 
um, soil building was like and, and really being able to, um, to harvest and, and do things that basically you, would, you wouldn't have to really rely on commercial um, fertilizers. Um, but I, again, like the antidepressant, the microbes in the soil are very healing. They, um, they, I think that for me, it's been a big part of my um, healing for um, my own children and my grandchildren. I have actually taken my um, little ones out into the garden what, as soon as they were able to walk and to start connecting with the soil and putting their hands in the soil and really start um, connecting with the plants as well. Um, once you start realizing and observing plant behavior and um, knowing what those, ben those benefits are, you know, plant, the health benefits of the plants and why that is so um, that plants communicate through the soil as well. So if you have a healthy soil, then you, um, you, are, you have an advantage to really grow as much as you can. Um, but knowing what healthy soil looks like and what unhealthy soil looks like is something that you have to learn. And it's not something that can just be easily told to you. You have to be out there um, tasting your soil and getting your hands on the soil and smelling the soil and really becoming intimate with it. And that's what it's, it's about is really um, having that um, connection and um, knowing what's living in your soil. And um, a lot of people really don't take the time to do that. Um, and as far as um, our immune system, um, a lot of the, um, some of the, the things that come out of that is um, when you, um, when you're in the outdoors as a child, um, that really helps you build that immune system and that helps like with either long-term asthma and allergies. And um, I know that some people, uh, parents won't allow their kids to get into the soil and to get dirty. And so um, I've always encouraged to really be a strong advocate for, for really kicking kids outside <laughs> and, and being able to um, do their own thing and, um, you know, because it's, 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 it is healthy and uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to that at all. Um, uh, I mentioned the intergenerational knowledge. I've um, also wanted to talk about the um, different techniques in different areas, depending on uh, the soil type and the regions. So like where I'm from, um, most of the area that I'm from on Den Denita, a lot of that land has been um, surface mined and especially at Hopi too. So there's a lot of uh, reclamation that needs to happen, but uh, you know, decades and decades of natural resource extraction is going to be um, probably five to 10 times um, longer to really start amending that. Um, destroying the, the top layer of the soil and destroying the nervous system in the soil, it's disruptive and it takes a long time for that soil to rebuild. And there are plants and there are trees and different types of things that can help encourage soil amending. But uh, you know, we always try and encourage people not to really chop up and do a lot of uh, tilling because that soil structure takes so long to build and um, it's just a whole communication system. And for people who don't understand what a communication system is underground, that um, again, the, the trees and the plants communicate through the soil. We have different bugs that communicate through the soil. You have these different symbiotic relationships bet between insects and plants and plants and animals that it really just starts from, um, from the soil. And so you have healthy soil, you're building flourishing ecosystems and ecosystems that are for different animals as far as habitats. And um, the more flourishing plant vegetation that you have, um, the more bugs you have. And then the more bugs you have, the more animals that come to feed on those bugs. And so it's, it's just this whole connection. And, um, and if you have um, healthy soil and healthy plants that um, livestock are eating, then of course, you know, we as some uh, meat eaters um, will be eating healthier meat. 
And so um, those connections impact all of us as humans um, from having healthy soil. And if you don't have healthy soil, then you hear you see a lot of the um, the health impacts, the detrimental health impacts that humans are having because of it, which are like asthma and um, other things that um, are really just you know um, polluting and tox um, toxifying our bodies. Um, but uh, let's see. Are there any questions at this time? Can I ask that from anyone? Desiree? I definitely have a question. I always have a question. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about like, if someone wanted to taste their soil, where would they even start? Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, which I know is not right. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't. How do you how do you drink it is, it, like if there's an area hopefully that your dog's not pooping there your cat's not pooping there and nothing's pooping there but um that you would start like if you wanted to do a garden area you wanted to start um building a garden that that's where you would start first but to make sure that that, that nothing like chemically had been like weed killer or gasoline or fuel that's been leaking from a car. I mean, you really want to make sure that nothing has been kind of in that area for like at least a few years um, and then just start from there and uh, and then look at different areas around in your yard and, or the garden beds and um, and just put, I just put like a little bit in my mouth and I put it on my tongue. I could probably demonstrate that for you, but um, just like like you're tasting food. Like what are the, what's the texture? What's the, um, the feeling on your tongue, on the top of your mouth, in the back of your mouth, um, on the tip of your tongue. And you can taste the different, um, the textures and the different tastes and the aftertaste. And once you start doing it, then you start noticing all of those tastes. And I've been writing down like every area what every, every area tastes like. And some of it just tastes like plain dirt, but there's other places that you can definitely taste some metals. You can taste, um, you can taste some magnesium. You, there's other places that have other things that um, maybe that have been sitting there. You know, um, we, I took some, uh, a taste of what our final compost um, area was from. And, and knowing that these other areas were going to need more amending and especially in the, the front area of the building. So um, you might have plants growing in specific areas that you can taste like the plant matter as well. Um, just when you're putting soil in your mouth, make sure that you're not eating any bugs because you might get a couple of bugs or something and you don't want those in your mouth. But um, I think you get, you know, just the more that you do it and you try it that you, you start becoming for more familiar and that's all it takes is you you don't know unless you have unless you try it unless you start doing it and it sounds a little bit silly but um if you really want to experiment and be curious about what your soil tastes like you know I mean as kids I used to eat soil so um I don't know how many others would do that but I really like the taste of soil and so when it was reintroduced as a technique for soil amending um it was not really a shocker to me because um, it's something that a lot of kids I think do when they, you know, were playing in the sand and stuff and it smells so good that you want to eat it. And that's kind of where I was at when I was little. I was always trying to make mud pies and, and things and it just smelled so good that I wanted to eat it. So, um, but I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I mean, if, if people are interested in wanting to do more, definitely reach out to me and I can, I can help and assist with that. It's just something in your area around your house that if you're willing, you wanted to do that, that that would be something that you could start experimenting with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How does that impact how your food tastes if you're growing food? How does it impact? Well, it depends on what you're growing. So if you're growing um, trees, uh, like uh, berry shrubs, if you're growing um, foods like the Three Sisters, that's more alkaline soil. And so you really want to um, start moving towards what those pH levels look like. You know, the pH levels and compared to soil tasting might be a little bit different, but um, I'd say that like with the acidic soils, 
um, you don't really have to do a lot with the acidic soils. If it's too acidic, then of course you can make, you know, raise the pH level um, utilizing other things like hardwood ash um, and putting that in your soil. But you just have to be careful, like whatever you put in your soil, you make sure it's not chemically treated. It's not, you know, it doesn't have anything that came from, has oil or anything that might um, might affect your edibles, especially if, you, if they're edibles. If they're just flowers and shrubs, then I would say that it might be okay, but no, like no weed killers, no um, fuel, no gasoline. I mean, just little things like that can really affect um, everything in the soil, especially your, um, your insects and um, other plants that might be already there you know so you're you're changing the soil type and uh, a lot of those um, oils and gases and heavy metals can really affect the soil for a long time and you really want to be careful what you're putting in your soil especially from your compost too and what you're putting in your compost it's all about really being mindful of of what you're putting in compost and that you're eating organic food um, and not heavily treated with GMOs. And so it's, it's a whole mindset and it's a whole awareness, but it starts from shopping. It starts from where you're shopping, where you're getting your food, unless you're growing it yourself, because you don't know where your food is coming from, if it's at King Supers and, and you really want to know, you know, how the manufacturers are um, getting their food and then if they're getting them from specific growers, if those growers are using chemically um, treated um, fertilizers. And so um, every little bit of knowledge that you can gain into um, amending your soil the most organic way um, comes from just really kind of tracing wherever, wherever you're getting your food from and how that's being composted. So it's just, it's a whole mindset, but once you start doing it, you get into practice of consistently being aware and, um, and that, and, you know, and then you just go from there and then you try it and, and if it starts working and you start building healthy soil, you'll see it Im immediately within three to six months as your soil every year gets darker and darker. And so that's what four wind soil has been doing is it's been getting darker every year, it's becoming richer every year. It's smelling more like you know like it should be um, rather than just clay because of the on the top surface mother earth the 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 dirt and the the land is constantly shifting it's slowly shifting but everything underneath is even shifting more so as we're encouraging and helping mother earth with the soil amending process you know it doesn't take much to encourage her and she's doing the rest of the work so we're just kind of we're kind of um, helping her along and we're really encouraging her to do what she needs to do. And the whole communication systems with the plants and the soil, they're actually doing what they need to do. We're just kind of giving them a nudge, if that makes any sense. Any other questions? I actually <laughs> have three questions. Sure. Three. So I want to know, first question, what is like grade A soil taste like? Like your best soil and like that is like, you'd have it for breakfast. Like what does it taste like to you? And then uh, I guess I can ask another question after you. Or you so, want me to ask all three at once? No, you can ask all three, I don't mind. Okay, so grade A soil, like top quality, five-star rest indigenous restaurant. Uh -huh. um, can you taste NPK? in soil, like and nitrogen, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Cause I know those are like the three main components in soil that usually the plants that we wanna grow need some form of that. Right. I don't, then, I have, yeah, I don't know what phosphorus, I think I kind of know what phosphorus tastes like. I don't know what the others taste like. I know what magnesium tastes like. But the other stuff I can't pinpoint. And so that's, I mean, it would be really nice to have other people who have been doing this. And I don't know if there's a lot of them, but to really just have this, this discussion on what it, what it tastes like. Um, I do have some elders at Hopi that I am actually been in contact with, but some of them, it's just, they either don't wanna share the knowledge, which is fine too, but um, in the way most of the Hopi farmers are men, as well too so there's protocols on 
what women can do and what women can't do. And I think as an urban native, I can't consider myself as like this traditional person because I've been here in Denver for a long time. And so I'm learning a lot of this on my own and I'm practicing it on my own because I want to teach my children and my grandchildren, especially. Um, I know that they're going to need this in times of survival, times after COVID, you know, that we have to rely on if we can't afford other, you know, medicine so that we can grow our own. But I would say like a perfect soil like a perfect grade a soil was what i tasted out there in terms of compost which was fluffy it was light it was like um i could compare it to like um just it was it was uh it was moist and it had a really good um texture in in terms of just being fluffy and it didn't not one um not one tasted out more than the other, but it was um, it was kind of like um, oh, how could I compare it to? I could compare it to like eating something squishy, <laughs> but satisfying. No, really satisfying. So you guys would have to come out and taste for me as well. But it was satisfying. Like oh my god, I could really eat this. Like I just swallow it and I'd be great, you know. But um, it didn't taste like there was no aftertaste. There was no like stuff stuck in my mouth that was just like chewy or anything. It was just very, I just can say just fluffy. And it, it, um, it um, really had this, uh, this um, it was just, it was satisfying. That's all I can say. It was satisfying. And um, I guess compared to the others one was more of just like dirt like the smell of dirt the taste of dirt it was powdery it was like it just you put it on your tongue and it was just dirt so that was the area that was closest to the sidewalk and then inside one of the medicine wheel um the the south um west the southwest um direction tasted like there was some metals or some aftertaste now we've also been growing like the maximilian um sunflowers which are the colorado sunflowers and those are supposed to actually sunflowers um absorb heavy metals you know so so as we're really trying to amend our soil in multiple ways through composting through sheet mulching which is another technique but or lasagna gardening but you're basically digging in kind of your comp fresh compost too which is another technique but um and then through uh using different um plants to kind of absorb those heavy metals and the, the toxic stuff in the soil. So, um, so we're doing it on various levels, but also, you know, when we plant, we sing to our plants, we talk to our plants, we have that intimate relationship with the plants. And so we're asking the plants to really encourage and helping us with our soil and helping us, you know, um, sprout the best seeds. And so we're actually like cheering them on from the first time that they're planted. And, um, I know that um, our ancestors had that relationship. They have the, they've had this knowledge that they've passed down through us and it's through, through our genetic memory, you know? So really encouraging learning about that. And the only way that you're gonna able to remember a lot of that is to connect with the soil because a lot of that knowledge is genetic memory in the soil. And it's through seeds because those generations of ancestral seeds and heirloom seeds have that relationship with our ancestors. So if you have ancestral seeds, it means your ancestors connected with those seeds. And so just like humans, seeds are just like humans. They pass on that genetic memory. They pass on that information. And when you introduce yourself to your seeds, um, breathing on your seeds, and, and they become familiar with you. They know who you are, they remember you. And so that relationship through the soil happens and it begins through the soil. And so this, this whole um, wealth of, of, of knowledge and um, it, it's passed through seeds and soil. And so as we go through our cycle, our lifetime cycle, we're really, building that relationship with the, the next two or three generations of seeds. And so through that, we're kind of sharing that knowledge because when you breathe on seeds, that's their introduction to you. 
and when they mature, once they get planted and you're in that garden with them and you're talking to them and you're touching them, they know who you are. So the seeds are very, very, um, they're very aware they're in a living organism. So they can, he they can feel your presence. They can feel your energy. They can, they know, you know, when you're inspiring them, they know when you're sad, they know um, they want to, they want attention. You know, anything that's living wants attention, whether it's trees or plants. And so we have to learn to treat our plants with, um, as a relative and um, those relatives, you know, coexisting with our plants as sustain us is um, a really beneficial way to really encourage um, healthier food and, and growing and preparing our plants too. When we're gonna harvest, that we prepare them that they know they're gonna be eaten because you know if it knows it's gonna be eaten, it doesn't know if it doesn't know it's gonna be eaten, it's gonna taste differently. But really honoring our plants and getting them prepared to know that they serve a larger purpose and a meaningful purpose and a sacred purpose that they're keeping us alive. And that's something that's very important that's been very lost in not what we eat, but how we eat. And I believe um, really um, being able to talk to our food and being able to have that connection, that intimate connection again is very vital and important. And I think a lot of people um, take that for granted that um, it's here, let's eat as much as we want, um, but not do it in an honorable way, um, which meaning, you know, meaning that the pollinators put in energy into this, the soil put energy into this, our plants, like this whole, um, this whole cycle of nurturing and love that has been put into our seeds um, really pays off in the end because then we have healthier plants and we have healthier soil. And it's all just, you know, having a little bit of knowledge on what you're doing um, to your soil and how you're planting and how you're really honoring those plants. Um, it, it really goes a long way because then you're having a higher um, seed um, preservation. You're, you're acclimating seeds to better soil and you're increasing the seeds um, health, I guess, um, producing healthier seeds and as you're producing healthier seeds um, and if you're if you're trying to introduce seeds from a different um, region into um, a, a region that's completely um, uh, how do you say alien then you're really changing that seed type and for these seeds that are in home soil these ancestral seeds and heirloom seeds I wouldn't change I wouldn't try and change them because they are grown for generations and generations in their own home soil. And um, as, as a lot of these um, uh, non-native people or permaculturists are trying to, to do things specifically to change soil types and to change um, you know, the, the seeds that are, they're introducing into other soils, um, it's not beneficial because that genetic memory of that seed is, belongs in their home soil. And I firmly believe that when you when you do that, you're displacing the seed, and you're going to get something completely different. And um, it's it's something that people just don't think about. And I think people need to be more aware of that. And what was your other question, Brooke? Ooh, that was fire. A long answer. <laughs> that was a, a long answer and lots of fire. And I appreciate that. I think it's really important that you talk about seed sovereignty and that these are, you know, our relatives also. And the way you talk about them, it's really beautiful. Mm, um, thank you. So my last question was kind of like a double, but like, are, do you have like, like soil recipes that you can mix soil into? And then also with your youth center, do you have soil tasting competitions? <laughs> We should. Um, I think what I'm gonna do is like uh, talk to our four winds um, leadership, and we we have some. Uh, we have the summer associates program that's gonna be taking place, and half of those summer associates are native. And I, in the past, we've had um, we've had different things on on recipes for different indigenous foods that we've been growing, um, like the Hopi amaranth, which is labor intensive. Um, nobody knows about Hopi amaranth, and it. Um, 
Yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, so uh, like soil recipes, it depends on the season. It depends like on the short growing season and basically your elevation and what you're growing. So I think to have a really healthy soil um, for different vegetables, it just depends on where you're at. If you're in the middle of the city, your soil, the soil erosion in the city is much higher than any other area. Um, especially if you're, you know, there's a lot of cars or by a highway. So everything impacts your soil. Um, as far as um, soil contests, I think that's kind of, that's kind of cool. I've never thought of that. Um, I just thought soil tasting was different than what um, other people are doing. And I thought it was at the same time unique because it's, it's, knowledge that has not been reintroduced and I think that if we really go back to the basics of having this intimate connection with soil that this is one technique that can be utilized in order to to become more familiar because um, you can use a pH soil tester you can do other things to test your soil but I think the best way is just through your own senses and knowing because then you're going to be you know you're going to have the intimate connection with your seeds and why not have um, that whole entire um, connection all together to know, you know, what's best for your soil. And um, since you're the one growing everything and you know what's in your soil, um, it's just part of that, those senses that come into play. And it's just, again, returning back to the basics. But if we have, if we have a soil tasting contest, <laughs> I will definitely, um, I'm definitely going to think about that because I think that's really cool to have and, and to really have people just start diving in and getting connected with their soil or bringing soil from their home and, and being able to, you know, to, um, to do that as a way of um, really becoming familiar um, at, different, at different levels. And I think it, it sounds to people, it sounds a little silly, but, you know, and our ancestors knew so much more through these intimate connections and I think we need to to start doing that again. Was there another question? Um, I think we might have one moment. I think we might have lost Desiree. No, I just got, I just came back. I heard something. Quit and then and then now I'm back. Oh, <laughs> Desiree's know. back. Yeah. Oh, cool. We lost Great. Desiree for a second. So, are there any other questions um out there? Um, I have another question I could ask. Which sure. okay. So I've heard about soil tasting by putting soil in cheesecloth and then kind of straining the water out through the cheesecloth. Yeah, I haven't heard. Hmm. I wish I knew. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. I, just, I never thought of putting soil through cheesecloth, but if other people are, are being able to do that, I mean, whatever works. Um, if that works to help people like start um, becoming more familiar with the taste. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you have to kind of know what different minerals taste like as well too. And I think just that just comes through practice of um, soil tasting. And the more you do it, I think the more that you become good at it of what healthy soil tastes like. And um, and I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, there are other people out there who have, who are doing the technique that um, we reach out to those folks too, because it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an old teaching and it's an old um, technique that I think um, would benefit anyone who is actually working in the garden and, and being able to, um, to know what, you know, their vegetables are going to, you know, the type of soil that their vegetables and their seeds are going to be planted in. Um, and I think that you just, you know, once you start doing it, you, um, you really start knowing the different tastes and the textures. 
And I just would encourage people just to start doing it more and more. Uh, just one more question for the urban natives. Um, composting uh, and soil health for indoors and outdoors, because urban natives will probably be more indoors. So they have a community garden around them, but how can they start to manage their compost the, um, from home versus outdoors? So if you're in an apartment and you're limited, you don't have a balcony, you can do indoor composting. You can do indoor composting in a five gallon bucket, um, a five gallon bucket that has um, small holes, but basically the balance of nitrogen and carbon um, work hand in hand. So if you have the right combination, the right amounts, your compost shouldn't stink at all. But if it's stinky and it's smelly, it's probably too much, um, too much nitrogen. And that's what kind of attracts um, flies, fruit flies and different things. But if you have the right amount of carbon, it should never stink. So you can do it in five gallon buckets if you have small amounts of compost. Um, there is another uh, place called Compost Collective that we've been working with, with Food Bank. And they collect, I think it's $5 um, every week or $5 a month to collect the compost. I think it's like $5 a week, but they give you a compost bucket for you to put your compost and they come and collect it. And then they turn that into fertilizer. So um, they found a way to help people um, really kind of give back in the way through, um, through collecting compost. Uh, we have done the different techniques and I've done also practice different techniques out of my own house in um, worm composting worm bins, like in having in indoor worm bins, um, creating and designing different worm bins to suit apartment life. Or if you have a large house, if you have a, lot, a large family and your family eats you know, a lot of food and you have a lot of food scraps. So different, there's different ways to, um, to take care of that as far as um, food scraps and composting. Um, if you wanna do hot composting, you have to have access to the sun and probably a good bin that will um, sustain having um, specific amounts of food waste um, in terms of like just how much you're eating and how much you're needing to compost. And so um, it, it's, it's once you start doing it, I think you get better at it, but for some people who are very hesitant to, to think, oh yeah, well, we're gonna have fruit flies and we don't wanna compost a stinky compost bucket in the apartment, you know, but there's ways to, to do that and not have to have the smells in there. So um, it can be done. And if people need help with that, I can certainly help with that. And we can also get um, uh, someone from Compost Collective to, um, to help assist with that as well. So we do have connections for people to help. I have a question yeah. again. Sure. What, okay, so I was really just thinking about you talking about breathing on seeds and how so that the seed will know you when it becomes a plant, mm -hmm. like that relationship. Are there any words that you could share with us about how to respectfully approach plants that we're going to eat? Like we're going to eat these plants or otherwise right. consume their body. <laughs> and so how, how do you approach relatives that you're eating? I think that you prepare them for that. Like when, when we're, when I introduce myself to seeds before I plant, I let them know um, you're going to sustain us and you're going to be something that's going to, you're going to keep us alive. And we rely on you for that. And I always like to motivate my seeds by saying, I am going to nurture you. I'm going to love you. And you're going to be able to take care of me and my family. And I really honor that, that you're going to be part of me, you know, so in a way that you're preparing them and you're going to let them know, you can let them know from the beginning that you're going to be food for me and my family. And I really appreciate you. Um, and just having that because they're living organisms and they, um, they need encouragement. They need to be, no, to be, no, to be told and they need to know that they are loved and they're very important and that prepares them. I'm hoping that prepares them, but I know that plant, plants scientifically um, have different ways of um, releasing different chemicals before that they're gonna be eaten. 
And so, um, because they are a living organism. And so we have to like pay attention to that. We have to like be aware that these are our relatives. And even though that they're used for food, that they are sacred and they are living beings. And so we have to honor that. And um, just because they're gonna be eaten. I mean, and I see like flowers in like King Supers, all flowers, their whole entire purpose to reproduce is to have one little piece of pollen so that they can continue. That's all they do. That's all they know. That's all they, their whole existence is to, to pollinate. And so when I see all these flowers in the stores, I'm like, you know, almost crying because I'm like, they just want to be pollinated, but they're going to end up dying, you know? So they're going to be decorations and things. So I, I always say, I don't like getting any flowers um, cut flowers because their whole existence is just to serve as you know decorations and they can't have fulfillment and so that might sound a little um, silly but I know like working around plants long enough that their whole purpose is just to reproduce and kind of like humans you know um, humans have a specific purpose to reproduce we were born that way and um and in the plant life you know plants have sex all the time and so when we start understanding um you know on, on different levels that that's something that that's something that we have to really yeah hold on a second okay 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 i'm sorry okay i'm sorry that our food bank is here i'm so sorry um but uh yeah, so, you know, having and understanding the, the plant behavior and understanding the functions of plants, basically, we want to, um, to have that deeper understanding and that intimate understanding of why we, we do what we do to connect with these plants. And so we come from that understanding, then we know, you know, but um, really talking to our plants and singing to our plants encourages them and inspires them but at the same time when we're ready to eat them we need to really have this connection to let them know that we appreciate them so that it prepares them that they're going they're going to be you know they're for us and that we're they're serving a greater purpose and I, I firmly believe that if we had more connections to our plants that um, we would be in a better place in understanding you know where our food comes from and that we honor that. And that's something that's sacred, you know, because our pollinators, without our pollinators, we wouldn't have anything. We would have to pollinate by hand. And if you don't know how to pollinate by hand, which I am learning, you're going to be screwed. Well, you have to depend on somebody to get your food from. But if, yeah, if all this shit goes down and things start happening and, you know, we don't have access to the grocery stores or farmer's market or local growers, we're gonna have to grow food ourselves, and without the pollinators, I'm telling you that we are really screwed. So um, those types of going back to basics are very needed, just in case you know um, that should happen. I really appreciate you saying this. It's really important, um, really important information with regards to how we're treating our pollinators and and where the soil degradation is going. Um, on a funnier note, though, I do know plants have sex a lot because every spring <laughs> I feel all these things crawl up in my nose as if I'm a flower. <laughs> yeah. And that's not cool. I just wanted to share that with you because you're a plant person. So please speak to them and tell them that my eyes and my nostrils do not need to get pollinated. <laughs> there was I was sitting in Cheeseman Park one day with my kids and they were playing and I kept seeing this yellow mist like every hour. I'm like, where is this? mist coming from is it like a chemical it's like somebody construction and it was a brute a blue spruce that was a male blue spruce that was letting his pollen on all the other female um blue spruces in the park and it was on the hour and i and i would and I, when i when i went home i had this yellow film of dust all over my body and i was like dang you know um but it also knew that the in the right wind conditions because it was windy that it was blowing to the other trees and so I was like wow this is how this is how he's having sex with the rest of the trees I just thought it was funny but I just like not I mean if I had been sitting there I would have never known and then I looked up online that this is how blue spruces actually emit their their pollen 
And um, it's just, it's really, it was really cool. It wasn't cool at the time, but I, I just thought, wow, you know, as humans are doing our own thing, that these plants are, are having sex. <laughs> I think it's cute. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, I just want to know if anybody on the chat or in the group wants to ask questions at this time. Hello, Shannon. Oh, it's Christina. Hi, uh, Christina. Hi. So, do you have? Don't you have workshops on soil building in Denver? Do you? Um, we're going to have more workshops on soil building once we, our summer associates um, program starts. And so, yes, definitely, we would love to have you come and we want to have our elders a part of that, um, learning about soil from, from different elders and mm -hmm. um, especially women to really start like getting that, um, getting some of the learning and the education information like to our young folks because we do want to have um, youth here and also educating our summer associates that are coming from here that some of them are not needed. We really want input from everybody on on um, some of those workshops. So it'd be great if you could attend. Uh, well, will you send out a schedule of a day? Yeah. Yeah, we're putting the, the calendar schedule today, I mean, not today, this week, the next few weeks. And so that'll be, yeah, that'll be um, given out. And we're going to have um, public, um, if we can't do it in person, we'll do them on recorded sessions too, because I know we're doing some of the stuff with a collaboration with some of the other school, Indian Ed School districts as well. So we're going to mm -hmm. do some indigenous cooking classes. Um, we're doing some um, soap making. We're doing, um, oh. I think we're going to do the choke cherry. Um, Chris, Christina Conquering Bear made wash oh, yeah. They went out and harvested like 30 gallons of choke cherries. So we're going to have that again. And um, we're going to have some language classes again. So we're going to try and have a full circle of health um, focused around indigenous foods. Oh, that's so nice. I'm trying to grow on my patio. Nice. I, live, I live on the third floor of, of an apartment building. Okay. And, and I thought, how in the world can I grow anything? Because, you know, I'm just getting excited about it. Well, so we had an old fish tank that my daughter was using for rats, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the rats had been moved into a bigger enclosure. Oh, wow. So, so I turned the fish tank into a terrarium. Nice. And, yeah, but I'm wondering about my compost. Now, I've been composting, and I've been uh, giving it to a young man who would come pick it up and take it. Um, I don't know where he took it, but uh, okay. he would, yeah, because I juice a lot. So when I juice, I have all of this, this uh, pulp left over. So that's yeah. what I'm composting. Now, somebody told me that if I wanted really good compost, I would have to, like, add soil to the to the um, the fiber product that I've been saving from the fruits that I was juicing. Okay. It, have you heard of that? Is that true? Um, so like the fiber from your food scraps and, and so adding dirt. So if you're composting, normally if you have worms that you're composting with, you're going to need something for grit. But most, most of the time that you, if you're doing indoor composting or any type of composting, you do need some soil to be um, part of that too, because some of the soil that's, that activates, like healthy soil that has healthy microbes and healthy bacteria will activate that um, for the other things that need, that need to start um, composting. So normally if you have like um, moldy leaves, moldy leaves that have been sitting over winter for the entire winter are perfect because they're slimy, they've got that fungus, that microbial stuff that's going to be, you know, activating everything else. So that's something that you probably should have. Um, but I know like with um, apartments, um, apartment style living that you can't do a lot indoors or outdoors so that you would have to probably do it in five gallon buckets unless you have sun on your balcony, like eight to 10 hours of sun, then you can probably do some hot composting, but you would probably have to have a compost bin to do that because it could yeah. get stinky, you know? Yeah, you know what I've been doing? I've been uh, taking all of the, uh, the pulp from the juicer and putting it into uh, Walmart bags and then uh -huh. tying them up real good and taking them outside and keeping them in our pet carrier 
so that the you know the two kitties on the on the patio can't get to them. So I've been doing that, and then I went and, and then I bought a, a five gallon bucket with a lid. Okay. And um, should I empty the bags out? Is that plastic not good for it? Or I was thinking that the plastic helps because it makes them it makes them hot for one thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, but but I I'm still wondering. So did you say it's nitrogen that would make make the compost stinky? Too much nitrogen? Too, yeah, too much nitrogen will make it really stinky. So that means you probably need to add some carbon. So like straw, newspaper, like shredded newspaper, car, uh, cardboard, cardboard, brown paper sacks, those types of things that you can add into the nitrogen that would make it less stinky. Um, uh -huh. And um, that would help. But also, if you have a five gallon bucket, you could layer. So, layering like um, the first two inches or four inches would be carbon and then nitrogen, add your food scraps, and then carbon again. And then as the weeks go by, it'll start compacting and it'll start, uh -huh. you know, so you don't even have to mix it. You can just layer it. And then as the weeks go by, it's going to start compacting probably like 50% after like two or three months. But it just depends on how, how much you're going through too so if you're doing a lot of smoothing things like that then you want to probably have more than one five gallon bucket and then yeah. um let that sit over and if you have somewhere to dump it in that'd be great but um i would also throw some dirt like a handful of dirt into that bucket as well to help activate it okay well that sounds wonderful so you're going to put up a schedule of uh workshops then yes <laughs> Yes, we will definitely do that. I will probably be teaching some of those workshops and we have others like Sky um, and a few others um, other for Wins Leadership that will be doing some workshops. Oh, that'll be wonderful. Okay, I look forward to that. Great, and thank I wanna, you. I want to try to make it down, um, but if not, then I'll definitely watch online, yes? Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're trying to put a webcam in the garden too, so that uh, people can oh. see the garden flourishing. Yeah, so we're 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 working on that. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful! So you can right, come to Four Winds. You could see it on a, a link online. Okay. All right. Well, you have a good day, and thank you. That was a wonderful presentation, but I missed the first half. That's why. Oh, that's okay. I'm, yeah, I wasn't sure if my questions were going to be like um, something that you've already covered. It probably were. Well, it's a good question because a lot of people don't live, I mean, they live in apartments. And so it's good to, to ask questions like that because a lot of people want to grow food and do some, um, some uh, farming and, and uh, growing gardens, but they don't have the knowledge to do that. And so it's, it's not difficult at all that once you start doing it on, in your apartment. Oh, good. All right, then. Thank you, honey. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Love you, Christina. Thank you. So we actually have one question love you, love there. Mwah. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Can I ask sure. a question? Sure. Um, I love this idea of tasting the soil, and I'm very, very interested in jumping into this. And um, but my soils are very different, and I'm actually doing two gardens. I have a traditional, or not traditional, a modern garden um, where a lot of the soil has been brought in and honestly the seeds are all brought in so everything they're not heirloom seeds they're seeds I've gotten from packets from the store and okay. even the soil I made my own soil so in this case I went through a whole process of it, it's a straw bale garden so okay your soil, yeah. uh -huh. um, uh, organic nitrogen so I've been doing uh, blood meal and bone meal and then topsoil and then I'm also trying to tend the forest. And I have to tell you, when you're talking about this relationship to the seeds, to the plants, to the soil, I wanna go taste the, the soil that's in the forest. That seems more enticing than, I don't know, this one, where would you recommend that I start? Because if I started my garden, it's been created, like I said, mm -hmm. from, bags from the nursery and you know and blood meal and bone meal which is really like a byproduct of like you know right the, the <laughs> yuck <laughs> and, and um but I but I guess I could taste that but it does seem like much I love this relationship of the microbials and the fungi and the and the all the things like I feel like well that's exciting that's what's going on in the forest and that's been there for a long time um but where how would you recommend venturing into my soil tasting adventure <laughs> 
I would. I mean, in your own gardens, that's where you're going to start because then you're going to be, you're going to get familiar with what your soil tastes like. And the acidic soil in the forest is something that you can't grow your vegetables with. You can do berries and other things that live in the acidic soil, but your soil that you're growing your own garden, if you're going to have like regular stuff, corn, bean, squash, that's alkaline. And so, um, you really want to start where you're going to be building that. And, um, and I think that's just the best way to start because then you become familiar with the specific areas on, you know, what tastes, what tastes, um, what tastes different from this other space that's 10 feet apart. And if you have different areas that you're gardening or different garden beds, you really want to get the soils the same. So whatever you're putting in the soils, do it to both of them so that you don't end up with different soils unless you're growing specific things that require different pH levels or different soil types. So um, I know that tomatoes, tomatoes get a lot of that blight. And so you really need specific things to make sure that the tomatoes are healthy and they're, you know, they're, they're needing, they need phosphorus. And I think they need some, some other things that they're higher they're needing higher nutrients in different areas. So you just want to be kind of mindful of what you're going to be planting and that those soil types meet those seeds. And especially if you have organic seeds or heirloom seeds or ancestral seeds that you really want them in the best soil, but also that it has to mimic or be very um, similar to the, the soil that their home soil was grown in. So and a lot of people try and acclimate seeds to different regions and sometimes it doesn't work and then they wonder why their, their seeds aren't growing. It's because it's too much moisture, not enough moisture, um, something that they're not used to in the soil. And so you just kind of have to be mindful of um, really trying to not change your seeds. You know, there's a lot of um, growers that want the best looking corn. So they cross pollinate and they keep cross pollinate. And the perfect example is glass gem corn. It's been cross pollinated so many times. Um, it looks great. I've never tasted it, but um, but people really want things that are are different and that are beautiful. And so, like really changing those um, strains can be um, can affect the the nutrient um, the nutrient content that can affect um, anything that's you know that's um, that's part of the of the of the seed. And so you really want the best seed, but you want to do it organically and you want to do it in a mindful way too. And a lot of that is teachings from um, indigenous wisdom and, and having those indigenous teachings and really listening and paying attention. But I think when you're doing stuff in your own soil and with your own seeds, that you're really paying attention to um, what that means so that you're not changing the seed and you're not changing you know anything to um to to change the structure of that and uh and i think a lot of people don't think about those things so i would um definitely start from your own garden start from your own around your house inside your house wherever you're going to be growing stuff start tasting that soil to see what it it tastes like so that you're familiar with it and you write those things down. What does it taste like? What are the aftertaste? What like you can feel things on your tongue, in the back of the tongue, and your the tip of your tongue, the roof of your mouth. That's where I taste most of it. And then on the sides of your tongue, what do those those um, things taste like? Because the more that you do it, the more that you're going to become familiar, and you're going to know what areas are going to need more mending. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, I don't know what I'm. Um, I don't know what I'll be tasting for, but I can at least modify I can at least like try to learn the palette of what it tastes like but I don't know if I'll know oh that's right or that's wrong you know or whatever yeah. well the compost but that I tasted I was telling everybody it tastes fluffy and it's very in a way it's just satisfying it tastes really good and uh and, and the other soils in the different areas like tasted very different but the fertilizer the one the compost the finished compost was just like I can't explain other than how fluffy it was and it was moist. It was kind of like spongy, but it was just very satisfying. I mean, I could have eaten that, you know? So, and that's kind of like really weird, but like the, the, the taste and the texture was just really, it was really good. Wow. Okay, that's all right, good. I mean, I have my compost. I have a large 
compost in the back of the house, but I, I haven't actually taken any of that compost and put it into the garden yet. It, it just hasn't happened yet because it's, I it's only like a couple of months old. Yeah. And once you don't smell anything in that compost and it smells like earth, that's what you want. You want it to smell like earth and if the worms are in there and other bugs are in there, you know, take a, take a little taste and see what it tastes like. And if you can still smell, you can still smell stuff through your taste. And if it still smells like unfinished compost, you'll taste it immediately and you'll smell it immediately before you taste it. So I would probably smell it and make sure that it's not, if it's unfinished, you know, not to really taste it, but I would, uh, I would probably give it another month or so. Okay. Wow. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for First Foods. Brooke, is there anything you want to say before we close out? Personally, I think Shannon should do like little candy packs of like <laughs> this soil that tastes so fluffy and you call it fluffy soil fluffy and soil. just send it out to people so that they can have a sample of what good compost tastes like. That's yeah, just my... come, over to, come over to Four Winds if you're close to it, but I could definitely, we could do something like that because um, I mean, just really getting your hands in the soil and you can feel it feels really good if you have healthy soil and you're getting your hands in the soil it feels really good it's just that connection and it's the coolness of the soil it's it it feels um it feels really good and you shouldn't be getting itchy you shouldn't be okay i'm coming out oh yeah go ahead yeah that's fine grab as many as you want thank you thank you Sorry, people are here for food bank. I got to get going. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I, I will definitely, um, people want to come and, and taste soil. Um, I would encourage that. And even if you're like at uh, a nursery too, like a plant nursery, I would, if it's organic compost, I mean, you could taste that too. I would, I would prefer tasting moist, wet compost than dry compost, um, just because it enhances like the flavor of the soil. Um, it just tastes so much better than eating dry dirt. Thank you so much, Shannon. We really sure. appreciated this and um, I'm really happy you were here and I learned a lot from you and it's been really an honor. Um, but I'm gonna pass over to Desiree because we're gonna do our final wrap up so you can get to your food pantry and then all of us could get to that soil tasting. Awesome, thank you so much for having me. Love you guys and let me know what you need and you can contact me on anything. Um, with any types of questions, there are no stupid, stupid questions. And so I'm happy to, to share my knowledge. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you to our partner, Ibex Puppetry and the community and support that um, is provided. Uh, next week for First Foods, we have Deb Echohawk, who is going to talk with us about seed keeping, plant nursing, She's a wealth of information, just like Shannon, where you just get so overwhelmed and just like motivated to just go to the garden and get your hands dirty or just go outside. So it'll be another excellent class. Um, the registration link is the same now. So it's bit.ly slash first foods June, July. And I'm gonna put it in the um, chat right now but it's the same one that got you here this time. So if you tuned in for the, for the Q&A, that's how you got here. So we look forward to seeing you. I just saw Hotoi, Brooke's son, was waving at us too. Always good to see the really young ones around learning these kinds of things. So uh, with that, I just wanna say thank you and uh, see you next week. Great, thank you. I have some handouts that I can send to you if you want to send out to everyone too. Some other handouts on um, seeds and uh, traditional indigenous foods or superfoods. I can send those along too. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Shannon. Thank Bye. you, thank you Shannon. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone.